Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the ninth annual Wild Writers Literary Festival. My name is Susan Bryant, and I'm here to welcome you to this evening's conversation, Characterizing Climate Change, with novelist Catherine Bush and writer Mahat Jain. This year's festival is, of course, unique because we're hosting you online from Waterloo, Ontario throughout November. Um, we certainly miss meeting people live. As a host, I'd love to give you some lovely Waterloo region cheeses and beverages, but things are not going that way these days. Um, the silver lining of that situation is that we now have viewers, um, people attending the festival from across Canada and even across the world. That's, that's beauty. Please uh, visit our website for a list of the workshops, conversations, mentorships, and meditations that are part of the festival. I would, of course, like to extend our heartfelt thanks to the festival donors and sponsors. We're immensely grateful for their support. I'd also like to thank all the volunteers who have made this festival possible. So here are our presenters for this evening. Mahat Jain writes fiction and poetry for young people and adults. She's the author of the picture book, Maya, illustrated by Ellie McKay, which was a CBC Best Book of the Year, a Kirkus Best Book of the Year, and winner of the 2017 South Asia Book Award. Her short fiction and poetry have appeared in magazines across the US and Canada, and she's been long listed for the Writers' Trust of Canada McClellan and Stewart Journey Prize. Hawk has also worked in publishing as an editor and has developed programming to feature underrepresented and emerging writers. He was born in Delhi, India. Mahawk has also lived in Dubai, Massachusetts, New Jersey, and Montreal. Currently, she lives in Montreal, in Toronto, where she's a professor of creative writing. Catherine Bush is the author of five novels, including her latest, Blaze Island, which is the focus of this evening's discussion. Her other novels include the Canada Reads long-listed Accusation in 2013, the Trillium Award shortlisted Player's Head, 2004, and The Rules of Engagement, 2000, a New York Times notable book and a Globe and Mail Best Book of the Year. She was recently a Fiction Meets Science Fellow at the HWK in Germany and has spoken internationally about addressing the climate crisis in fiction. He's an associate professor at the University of Guelph and coordinator of the Guelph Creative Writing Masters of Fine Arts. So now I'm going to uh, turn things over to Mahat Jain and Catherine Bush. Um, remember that you can submit questions in the Q&A box as we go along, and we'll get to as many as possible near the end of the session. Hello, everyone. And thank you, Susan, for that introduction. And thank you, everyone, for joining us for today's event, Characterizing Climate Change. I am so excited to be in conversation this evening with Catherine about her most recent book, Blaze Island. Blaze Island is a Shakespeare-inspired novel about climate change that follows a climate scientist and his daughter on a remote island and is set in the aftermath of a terrible storm. Catherine and I had the chance to speak previously about this dynamic and timely book for the new Quarterly Magazine's website, and today I'm looking forward to continuing our conversation for the festival. I thought to start us off, um, we could begin with a reading from Catherine from a couple of pages from her book. 
Great, yes. Um, I just want to say um, what a great pleasure it is to be doing this event with you, Mehek, and, and just acknowledge, um, you know, the, the length of time that we've known each other sitting here. I was just thinking about when we first met in a cafe and I was describing the Guelph Creative Writing MFA to you before you were a student in the program, as you then were. And, um, and yeah, you've done so many brilliant things since, and, and here we are. And um, yeah, it's, it's such a pleasure to be here tonight with you. So I'm going to read a little bit. Um, Mahek set the, the, the novel up a bit. There's a climate scientist, um, Millen Wells, who changes his, his name when he goes um, as a fugitive, runs away as a fugitive to this island in the North Atlantic, Blaze Island, um, becomes Alan Wells uh, with his daughter, Miranda. He flees to the island um, after he's set upon by climate change deniers and endeavors on the island to create a sort of safe life for his daughter, um, a sort of protective bubble in a, an off-grid life in a small house and an isolated cove. But um, life and the world gets more complicated. And um, this, this gives you a sense of, of the community and, um, and their situation. Miranda's been telling me polar bear stories, Alan said, as Pat folded his long legs into a chair. Your mother's, for instance. Here's another. I was out hunting with some Inuit friends up on Devon Island, north of Baffin, got caught in a spring blizzard, which blew for three days, the tent humming and vibrating like a bad radio signal the whole time. One day I woke up to what I thought was a different kind of wind, shaking, then not, shaking, then not. The next moment, a pair of claws rips right through the nylon. Just what you needed, a little breeze, said Pat as he downed a mouthful of tea. I fired out the front and managed to scare the creature off. There was something theatrical about her father's manner, yet the story was a true one that Miranda had heard before. He was after something. She wasn't sure what. Sea ice up north is thinner, so more find themselves stranded out on the ice, unable to return to land, Pat said. They'll be caught on ice flows when ice breaks up in the spring and end up floating south on the Labrador current. I've seen paw prints out near Green Cove Pond, big as dinner plates. Is that so? Alan said meditatively. Harry Pratt keeps a record of all the weather around here. Clouds that don't behave the way they used to. Fog coming out of the Northwest. Never before did that. Cedar wax wings, that's a bird we never used to see. And the ice. It's not the same ice. There's not so much of it for a start. Pans don't raft against each other on shore the way they once did. Her father's body grew still. Do you think Harry Pratt will talk to me? Outside, in the falling light, Alan and Miranda said goodbye to Pat, who set off in his big gray truck, a plume of exhaust settling over them. A moment later, Sylvia Borders, tall and lanky in her rubber boots, came walking in their direction with a profound, curious air that seemed to reach right to Miranda's steps. Good evening to ye, she said. Alan, not unfriendly, said, we're inspecting the wood that Pat has so generously dropped off for us. Crossing her arms over her thick sweater, Sylvia agreed that it was very kind. Pat mentioned that Harry Pratt keeps a record of the, we the weather in Pummely. Her father's body next to Miranda's was ticking, almost twitching. Yes, said Sylvia, useful, given all the weather weirding, as I've heard some call it. Does anyone around here deny the weather's changing? Perhaps her father was recalling his, his enemies, Miranda thought. Once, with something like anger, he'd let loose that they were still a force out in the world, growing stronger as the weather grew more unpredictable. There'd been a spate of wildfires in California. She'd glimpsed this on his laptop whole towns going up in smoke. Hard to do when you live as close to the wind as we do, when you step out the door and feel what's happening for yourself, said Sylvia. The weather's always been changeable, but it's never changed like this. So that's a taste of um, Blaze Island. Thank you so much, Catherine. Um, and it's true, I have we have known each other for seven years and I, I will say it is a privileged, I mean, I very much see Catherine as a mentor. So it is a privilege right now to be in conversation with her about her novel. Um, we're going to have a conversation now about um, this novel. 
And for everybody in the audience, just letting you know, you can drop your questions as they occur to you in the Q&A box and we'll take them at the end. Um, so speaking of having met seven years ago now, 2013, um, did you already know at that time that you were going to be writing this novel? Yes, it must have been in its earliest stages right then because my first trip to Fogo Island, which is the, um, the actual island that I fictionalize um, in Blaze Island, I visited once already in 2012. So I would say 2012 was when I began to think um, you know, sort of more forcefully about about this book, and and I, I began. I mean, its earliest um, sort of miasmic um, formulations were. Uh, I saw this production of The Tempest starring Patrick Stewart, who was this forceful, compelling Prospero, who wants power and doesn't want to give it up. And something about his portrayal made me think about a climate scientist. I don't know why, but some. Something about that that um, that conflict around around power, and I guess I began thinking about the human desire to be in control of our environments, and um, and also Prospero as a as a father, very strongly wanting to protect his daughter, um, and thinking, you know, what what would that be like in a climate scientist, and what would that lead a climate scientist to do? Um, and I don't know, I just had one of those kismet things at those moments where I thought I, I need to fictionalize this somehow. And then I had to find an island and I needed to find an island where I could go on some kind of writer's retreat and spend some time. And so I stumbled my way towards Fogo Island, which has a couple of writers um, residency programs there. And I was lucky enough to be invited to the one in Tilting, the village at the far end of the island. And you know, once I landed on the island and made my way across the island to tilting on the Atlantic side, and then when I discovered this little house beside the beside Sandy Cove, um, Reardon House, and stepped inside the doors that summer, I thought this is where my characters have to live. And so all of that was in place, I guess, by 2013. And then I kept returning every summer. Um, to just deepen my sense of the island, continue my conversations with people on the island about, you know, life, foraging, weather, weirding weather, changing weather, um, and because I needed that depth of texture about the, about the place and just to get it in my bones and under my skin and live with the wind. So yeah, that's that's where it began. So you saw this play Shakespeare at the Tempest. Um, and but the novel Blaze Island, which is very the Tempest inspired, there's characters that are you know counterparts of the characters in the Tempest, but it's very contemporary. It's very modern. Um, so did you know that at that point when you were going to Fogo Island that you were going to set it um, in our times right now, or did that was that developing over time? No, it was always very clear to me that that's what I wanted to do. And I think there's something about I, the way I work as a, as a writer. I mean, we all write according to our, you know, our, our brains and temperament. And I've always been very attracted to, to roping together seemingly really disparate ideas. And, and it's something about the charge of putting um, two seemingly um, incompatible things together that, um, that sparks something in me and makes me want to write. And so somehow there was something from the beginning about bringing the Shakespearean play, which I love. Um, and, you know, I love it. I've always loved islands. I love its island setting. Um, I love its mystery, but it's also very much a play about, about control and, and um, autocracy and, and also a father-daughter relationship. But I always knew it had to be contemporary and I was always going to write about the climate crisis somehow. Um, and it wasn't that I knew I was gonna write about the climate crisis before I had the idea to bring The Tempest um, into a work of fiction. Somehow it was the concatenation of those two things that um, brought the novel into to life, basically. So at the end of the book, you describe, I mean, you went to Fogo Island, but the sort of large amount of research that you went into the writing of this book, including reading texts about climate change, but also participating in climate change conferences. And um, I learned recently that there was a conference that you were inspired to go to because of your sister, Elizabeth Bush. I think it was a, con was it a conference in Berlin? 
Yeah, it was. Uh, so there's, you know, there's a couple of different strands in the in the novel, and there's the climate science. Um, you know, at Millen Wells is a climate scientist who's studying uh, ice cores, and be he begins studying paleoclimatology and and you know ancient ancient weather um, through ice cores drilled into um, Arctic ice, um, and then he's set upon by climate. Um, climate change deniers very much in the way um, that happened to actual scientists in 2009 um, in the lead up to one of the, these COP, they're called COP conferences and a council of the parties. There was to have been one this week, in fact, um, that was canceled due to, due to COVID. But there were some very well-known climate scientists in 2009 who were, whose emails were hacked and, um, and used by deniers or falsely used to um, to try to show that they were um, fudging data. I mean, it was all it was all um, you know a, a hoax. There was nothing wrong with their science, but it attracted a huge amount of attention, and they were under enormous stress. and And one of the scientists was, um, I believe, suicidal. And so I use a lot of that in the novel as the you know the the reasons for my scientist career collapsing and his his wife's death gets caught up in the protests against him and is another reason for him to flee um, as a practical practically as a fugitive to this this island and there he starts in desperation because nothing is really changing um, no one is really you know really responding um, in the outer world and the arctic ice goes on melting and he begins to be lured by the prospect of um, climate engineering, um, so to further, you know, we were already altering the climate, but to hack it further um, in a in a potentially remediatory way, and you know, this is um, you know, there's a lot of um, you know ethical debate about about this. And my sister, I told my sister um, again, this was always clear to me very early on. I wanted to investigate this, but I, I told my sister, who's a Elizabeth Bush, who's a climate science. Um, advisor for the federal government. And she was the one who told me about this, um, this conference that was being held in 2014 in Berlin, which I think was the first big climate engineering conference. And, um, and what was so amazing about that conference was it was fantastically multidisciplinary um, because, you know, the climate engineering itself is not seen just as a hard science problem. I mean, it's an ethical problem that involves all of us. Like, how are we going to respond? And so as a conference, it brought in social scientists, hard scientists, philosophers, and, um, and artists. And I was a, on a panel of artists. And in fact, it was one of the most, you know, thrilling conferences I've ever been to at the level of, you know, just charged and urgent discourse about the future of the world um, with thinkers and, and um, just dynamic minds from all these different fields. So my sister and I went together um, and my niece, my sister's oldest daughter who happened to be in Berlin at the time too, tagged along and you know we would be at um, Berlin restaurants um, at the end of the day. Uh, discussing climate engineering. So it was a pretty remarkable and, and memorable uh, research trip. So I, you know, climate engineering as an idea was new to me um, uh, until this novel, until reading Blaze Island. Um, and for those in the audiences who are more like me unfamiliar, so it's this idea, like you said, it's ha hacking, um, hacking climate change, where you don't resolve climate change, but you find alternate solutions. Have I understood that correctly? Yeah, I mean, it's a very complex um, and, and wide ranging field. And I, in the novel, I'm talking about a specific form of climate engineering, um, solar radiation management. And that, I mean, there's other, there's other forms. Sar carbon sequestration could be seen as another kind of climate engineering, but solar radiation management um, basically is um, uh, um, putting, um, particulate matter into the stratosphere, um, spraying particulates into, into the stratosphere, the high atmosphere, to reflect back sunlight, sunlight and moderate the, the global temperature. It, um, it doesn't actually do anything to carbon levels, but it, it does moderate temperature. It does the sulfate particles, um, which is one potential particle that could be used, do what volcanic dust does. It's basically, that's the, that's the simple model of, of what, it might, what it might be. And planes or balloons might be, um, might be used. And in fact, there's a Canadian scientist, David Keith, who was on The Current um, 
I guess last week discussing discussing this with Matt Matt Galloway. So I mean, and he is one of the best known proponents uh, and current researchers in the field of solar radiation management. Um, so yeah, that's a, just a quick <laughs> a quick glimpse of it. I mean, I think even your explanation just now demonstrates how you know conversations about climate change. Um, they're so scientific, they have so much data, there's so much policy involved, and um, in some ways not very accessible to um, the public. And this climate engineering conference, um, like that, its goal was to see how, you know, just the ordinary person could relate to this idea of climate change. And today, of course, we're talking about characterizing climate change. And so you've taken all of this science, this all of this data, all of this policy information and then transformed it into a story that takes someone like me, a layperson, and makes it very understandable. But what was your process for just digesting all of that sort of confronting information and sometimes you know information that just makes it very hard some to understand climate change in a really felt way? It's interesting because I'm not a scientist. I don't approach any of this as a scientist. Um, I approach it as a novelist. Um, and I'm looking for experience, you know, so I mean, what I took away from that conference as much as anything was um, an artist, you know, um, having us drink, you know, cloud, you know, cl cloud, um, yeah, clouds that were um, dissolved into actual liquid or, or a man standing, you know, in a, in a room and um, a man from the Southern has Hemisphere desperately um, you know, calling for attention and and feelings of grief and anguish from the people surrounding me. I mean, it was that was the most the most key thing was the the emotion that I was surrounded by, and and that's what you know. I'm interested in climate scientists because they have to hold so much grief and anger and fear, and and you know, when I'm creating a character like Millen Wells. I'm asking myself, you know, how do you know how do you hold all that emotion and 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 parent? Um, you know, how do you protect your child? And and I'm you know I'm not a parent. Um, and I also wanted to flip the perspective and and narrate from you know the decentered place of the younger characters, Miranda, who's a late teenager at the time the novel takes place, and and um, Caleb, who's the Caliban character, who's um, a mixed race boy whose mother has lived on the island for a long time and whose father is unknown, but um, Alan Millen, the scientist, becomes a kind of quasi father who's then lost to, to Caleb as a father figure. And so, you know, and how, so I'm very much narrating not from the perspective of scientists, neither Miranda nor Caleb as a scientist, and they don't. So I was also always, um, always wanting to, to narrate from, from that position. So they're, you know, bewildered half the time. They don't necessarily understand what um, what Alan, you know, Millen is, is is doing, and so I I really want to to root the reader in in ex, in experience, in sensual experience, in emotional experience, and it seems to me, you know, that that's key in in how we respond to and how we need to make narrative out of the climate crisis. I think that's, that's beautiful because when I think about it, it's true, the way media presents climate scientists is are these sort of um, very rational figures who are giving us instructions on what we ought to do, um, but we don't get to experience or see what it's like for a climate scientist to live with the knowledge um, or, you know, that the world that they know is disappearing. And so really characterizing that um, in the form of Millen Wells, but then also through Miranda and her relationship to um, the environment around her. And there's a, um, I think you taught when last time we were talking about um, the novel, you talked about how you really wanted to make the biosphere come alive on the page that you didn't want to just center humans, uh, you wanted to um, center uh, the wind, the ice, other life forms. And I'm curious what that, what is that also a part of characterizing life, um, climate change? Like what, how did that take form for you as a writer on the page? I have a, I have a quote here, I actually want to read it. Um, okay. It's just, there's such beautiful and lush language in this book. Um, just to give you a sense of what I'm asking here. So on page 123, Caleb is, he's showing Miranda the environment and he says, 
or, or the narrator says, pack ice is what the sea brings in, Caleb told her. Slob ice lies like a slushy skin over the water and moves with the waves. Brawly catters, those are the big pans of ice rafted at shore, their blue-green edges sharp as knives, and the slippery mounds of ice that salt spray sends to coat the shore rocks. Thank you. Um, yeah, there's some, you know, beautiful Newfoundland language and those the, the words for different kinds of ice, which I mean, I just, uh, it was a gift to be able to, to use them. But again, you know, um, giving me a, a language of specificity about about the ice and a, and a way to, to, to see it. And I guess, yeah, I mean, I, I, I felt that it was important um, when thinking about how to write a, a novel that um, responded to or dramatized the, the climate crisis, um, that it couldn't just be a human story. And that, you know, part of what, if there's any kind of, and I really don't believe in writing um, novels with messages at all, at all. Um, but if there's anything that experientially I wanted to do, it was to decenter the human story and amplify all these other elements that we really need to pay attention to if we're going to survive, that we need to see ourselves within this much broader web of, of kinship and liveness. And, and so I wanted to um, write characters who had these, um, this heightened sensibilities and, and awareness of the natural world. And Caleb in particular is very, um, you know, drawn to animals and bird life and sort of in moments of stress, um, you know, it, it loses his sense of his own body and becomes a bird or becomes a caribou or, or a fox um, as in, a, yeah, re-embodied in that way. And Miranda is uh, much more attuned to wind and listens to the wind and you know has been taught by her father to feel the wind directions and and that's something I've had to learn you know is to really be super aware of wind directions um, in a way that I never used to be before writing this book um, so yeah there is it was and it was a, a pleasure just to sort of keep thinking as I entered the scene and Miranda has a dog okay you know how, how the how was the dog a living presence on the page and not just um, you know, doing something that the, the novel needs to her to do, but she also had to play a dramatic role at some point. But, you know, what, yeah, what's the sea doing? What's the sky doing? Where are the fish? Um, and just constantly be asking myself these questions. Yeah, and you, you said before, um, last time when we were in conversation, you, you mentioned how it, this novel is very realistic. Um, it's not a you know dystopic novel. It's not um, an alternative um, reality. It is very very in our immediate sort of present. Uh, maybe a couple years forward, but it's very immediate. And um, but you talked about how we have this understanding of realism, and that that understanding can be pushed, and um, that realism you know as just reflecting our world. It's been a very certain kind of realism up to this point in literature. Can you talk more about that, your decisions and thinking through that language and what you were doing on the page? Yeah, I mean, the, the Canadian American writer, Lydia Millet has also, um, and she's just written a, a climate theme novel too, um, The Children's Bible. And, and she's written a lot about, about the, you know, the way the novel has this humanist tradition that's very human focused. And, um, Amitav Ghosh, who's also written about the, the need for writers to address the, the climate crisis, has spoken of the way that we might need to return to older forms of storytelling, um, you know, folk modes in which animals are, it's, it's, you know, it's normal for animals to be alive and for people to communicate with them, or trees or, or plants. And, and, you know, that may be described as magic, but it's also an animate, you know, living, um, world in in you know all its diversity and so it's pulling forward some of those older traditions that in a sense got squashed by um humanism and um the novel as it took form in the industrialized west um often a very bourgeois form and that, that came to really focus on individual lives on domestic lives and there are plenty of other traditions of of the novel um, but it does seem to me at this point in time that there is, um, you know, there is a new liveliness to be found by pushing beyond the human story and a necessity to push beyond the human story. And that that is, uh, 
you know, an old and new kind of kind of realism. We're used to thinking of realism as being human focused. Um, but I think that there's a real place for, for novelists, for, for writers um, to think beyond the human story and think what new possibilities there might be um, for the real. Um, I do think too that, um, you know, one of the challenges of writing in relation to the climate crisis is that you, you have to write against potential cliche or you know what's what's known, and even the dystopic modes feels you know so so known at this point, and and to be looking always for the the specific, um, you know how do you, how can you tell it slant, and how how can you um, evoke as as we want at every instance as artists and writers to evoke in our readers something something new? How do how how can the reader feel something they've never felt before? Um, I tried to avoid the words climate. I mean, and Alan tells Miranda not to use the word when they when they move to the island. And that was also something in literary terms. I wanted to remove it from, from the book just because of the often cliched um, response that we have to the phrase climate change. But yeah, always what um, what experientially can I bring to the reader that they that they might not have noticed before? All those specific noticings and ways of feeling. That's, you know, that's a that's a writer's challenge, a realist challenge. Um, yeah, uh, that's that's what that's what writing is ultimately all about. Um, I want to keep continuing this conversation and just remind our um, audience as well, if you have questions, um, please just pop them into the Q&A box and we'll be taking them um, shortly. Uh, so continuing in that you said you, know, you wanted to avoid the word climate. Um, so I'm curious what your thoughts are on this um, term that's become very popular, calling novels about climate change, um, cli-fi or short for climate fiction. What do, you, what do you think about that term? Do you think it applies to Blaze Island or what does it even mean really? Um, I mean, I guess Blaze Island is a novel that addresses the climate crisis directly. And in that sense, um, yes, I think it could um, come under the um, umbrella of climate fiction, a, a cli-fi novel. Um, you know, I would argue that, it, that we're all somehow at this moment in time, you know, creating, in relation to the climate crisis, because it it exists as this, you know, underlying existential um, peril that you know we all inevitably are in relation to. Um, you know, cli-fi has a sort of genre, um, you know, um, or at the same time. So I don't, you know, I don't know how I how I feel about it, um, but it's. I was I was reading something interesting um, that was describing climate fiction the other the other day, and it was was saying that it um, the there was a risk in climate fiction of sounding patronizing towards the readers, and I thought, oh, that's a that's an interesting um, a way of phrasing it, patronizing, and I think it's because there's a a sense of an expected. Um, way in which we're supposed to respond um, to the disaster narrative in, in particular. Um, so again, I would just want to not be, um, you know, shut into any kind of taxonomy, um, which I, I guess climate fiction risks doing, but in so far as I think it can be an incredibly expansive term um, and, and call attention to the fact that we really do need to think and and write our way into relationship to the climate crisis, then yeah, happily I will I will accept the term um, climate fiction for this novel. That's interesting about this idea that of this fear about novels about climate change or works about climate change being patronizing. Um, there's another question I wanted to ask you, which I think relates really well to this. Uh, so, um, the Washington Post published an essay um, by Jimmy Ozaki, where he argues that we haven't stopped climate change because we're not wired to empathize with our descendants, um, which I think is maybe related to this idea of it feeling patronizing if done in a specific way in certain art forms, like the conversation on climate change. Um, how do you think artists or writers can play a role? How, how can, um, or even just, you know, those of us who are passionate about um, 
empathizing and learning to empathize with this issue, how do you think we can participate in that in that conversation around climate change? I think there are two, you know, there's two things. There are how we find um well, it's, it's very common. I mean, there's larger cultural narratives. I mean, how do we create cultural narratives that will make people pay attention to the crisis um, within the field of, of, you know, let's call it climate fiction. Um, it seems to me that, you know, the ongoing fight is how, how do we avoid, how do we avoid cliche in something that is so overwhelming and, and surrounds us and be, and, and evokes a set of, um, you know, overwhelming emotions potentially of, you know, despair, fear, um, you know, anger. And, and how do we, you know, make good art that doesn't tell people what to do or how to respond, but offers complexity. And, um, and there has to be, there has to be um, a sensual awakening that's possible too. And, you know, through, through specificity, through, you know, I often think, and I've referred to this before, but it sticks with me, you know, this element in, in Martha Bailey's novel, the, the, the Surf for Heinrich Schlogel, which is not a climate change novel per se, but, you know, the central character has a form of tinnitus in which he cannot stop tears. And it's just one, you know, note in a complex novel, but it sticks with me. And, and it's that stick with itness. And it may just be, you know, in, um, in, in, a, in a poem or in a novel, um, you know, one strand, one element like that, that just resonates um, one, one image, um, you know, in, in Blaze Island again, you know, they um, swallow bits of iceberg ice. And, and for me, I mean, I was really taken by what it means to swallow 10,000 year old ice and have little air bubbles of 10,000 year old air, you know, which is the span of time, you know, in which there's been um, a stable climate and humans have thrived to take that air into you and, and digest it basically. And um, so as a writer, I'm always looking for those kind of specificities um, and also trying to figure out, I don't just want people to, um, to end up in a despairing place. I want to tell them a story that is compulsive, um, allows them to transform, re-see the world and be seduced ultimately um, by, by story. So that's, you know, that's what I'm thinking about as a writer. And then as a citizen, I'm also thinking about this larger question of how do we, how do we shift, how do we create climate narratives that, um, that everyone will listen to, um, you know, and not just people who, you know, may be on board as climate activists, but, um, but yeah, everyone collectively as a society. You mentioned the taste of this 10,000 year old ice and um, I've seen you talk before about um, seeing ice, you know, and on Fogo Island and seeing ice pass and the beauty of it, but also the tragedy of it because it was melting right before your eyes. and. You've been visiting Fogo Island over quite a, a, a few years and islands are much more vulnerable to climate change than other types of landmass. So have you seen climate change impact Fogo Island over the course of your visits? In, in smaller ways, um, you know, I mean, I, I think like all of us, we don't need to travel to Fogo Island to experience unpredictable weather. Um, and that's, you know, the, the strongest thing um, I think everywhere, um, you know, rain in midwinter, sudden heat. Um, and on Fogo Island is in that little section that I read from you, you know, the, the lack of sea ice is, is, an, is a noticeable change. Um, someone was saying to me that, yeah, I think just um, higher, higher water in the harbor. So there's, you know, again, small things or, the, or new birds, you know, and it's, it's just very much this, this in incremental um, creep. But I, I wanted to go back. I realized I didn't totally answer your last question. And, and when you were, you were asking, um, and I, I, was, I was thinking about the whole issue of dis descendants and um, empathy and how do we empathy, empathize with um, you know, a broader range of possibilities. And I was thinking about um, 
you know, this philosopher Roman um, Krasharnik's idea of the um, tempus nullius, you know, that we tend to look at the future as this blank place. And, and, and it's not, you know, we need to think about the people who come after us and how we can be good ancestors. And again, you know, in terms of not just expanding outwards from, you know, the humans into the, um, you know, non-human life forms in terms of thinking about kin to think, to think for future, um, to think about future kin. And again, I think that, you know, that practice of empathy through, through fiction, through storytelling, um, is something that, that we can do. And I really try in, in Blaze Island to create this, you know, this really immediate sense of the, the now, but also this geologic span of time, you know, that, that pushes us into an unknown future, but also um, gives us a real depth of, of, of the past. And characterizing empathy for our environment, for you, that's, this is not the first novel you've done that in. Your, your, fir sorry, your first novel, Minus Time, also explores the similar topics of animal rights and eco activism. And how is your relationship to the environment, to ecology, and your sort of personal life as a writer changed between the release of that first book and this one? Yeah, that's such an interesting question. I mean, because certainly these issues have been, um, you know, present to me for a long time. And um, I mean, I, I think I was just always very you know, attuned to the natural world and, and concerned and, you know, to grow up in, in the late, late seventies. I mean, there was, you know, there was, there was an a, a ecological awareness um, that came out of the sixties the and seventies. And I, and I think um, I certainly, you know, grew up with that sense of the fragility of the, of the natural world. And, um, and yeah, an awareness of animal rights activism. And again, with Minus Time, I wanted to put together that um, the animal rights activists with this astronaut astronaut mother who dreams of going into outer space. And so I, I feel like the novels actually um, are quite beautiful companion pieces and speaking to each other in, in pretty fascinating ways. And I'm, so I'm really glad that you brought that up. Um, and I think they are just, you know, life long um you know aspects of of myself and and my way of 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 talking um through fiction i have a couple more questions that i, I really want to ask um I, I have about like a few minutes left before we're going to turn over to q a so in the audience if you have questions please um, throw them into the q a box and i will come to them in a couple minutes um i wanted to ask you you know a lot of research is coming out has come out that climate change might result in even more pandemics in the future. And so writing this novel, you know, promoting it right now, what are your thoughts on the relationship between our pandemic, pandemics and climate change and um, as you're working this novel through the world right now? Yeah, I mean, one of the things that, um, you know, that the, the pandemic teaches, teaches us is that, you know, we are so entangled with the natural world and, you know, the pandemic has crossed over the um, zoomorphic barrier between animals and, and humans and, 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 you know, another likely is to do it again. And there's already, you know, porousness of um, changes in, um, you know, in, in COVID itself. Um, and so I think the the pandemic asks us to be aware um, of that that wider biosphere and our responsibilities to it, and um, otherwise it's going to keep on happening. So, you know, that's one thing I take from from this current moment. And I mean, it was very strange to be um, well, you know, for all of us who are writers this fall to be putting books into the world, but. You know, and, and Blaze Island is not a pandemic novel, but it does have um, its central characters, Mill and Wells and his daughter Miranda are sheltering in place, in fact, on this island. I mean, he's trying to create this bubbled existence for her. Um, you know, they're not, uh, he won't let her leave the island and they're trying to be as self-sufficient as possible. And so in a sense, you know, they're living very much the way, you know, we've been living for the better part of the last eight months. My only regret is that I did not put more sourdough in the novel. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
Um, and the whole, I mean, and also just what you just, I mean, the whole island is so isolated too in your, in your book. All right, just one last question, then I'm going to turn it over to the audience. Um, so the reviews have come out and um, the novel is so suspenseful and evocative. Reviewers have described it as a thriller, a gripping page turner and a sizzling, I love that word, sizzling ecological thriller. So was that a response you were expecting or prepared for? No, probably, probably not. Um, I mean, I, I'm happy if people embrace it as a, as a thriller, that it's a page turner. I mean, obviously what writer does not want the reader to turn the pages? If not, you know, that's a big problem. So I'm very driven though, as a, as a writer by um, kinetic energy and, and, and movement. And, um, and so a kind of, of, you know, paciness is of, is of interest to me, but I don't really, I don't, I don't even think in terms of plot. I'm always thinking in terms of, of, of movement, mystery and movement, I would, I would say, and, and, and kinetic, kinetic energy, um, how to keep that, that kind of liveliness alive. And if people experience that as, as thriller-esque, I, I guess, um, I guess so, sure. <laughs> Um, okay, there's actually quite a few questions from the audience. Um, so there's, these two questions are similar, so I'm going to treat them as one. Um, can you make a st statement about the climate crisis and still have a good entertaining story? How do you avoid being didactic? And worded similarly, um, you've obviously done a lot of research for the novel. Can you talk about how can a writer put the research aside when working on the actual story of the novel? Hmm. I mean, I would just, you know, say in response to the first question, um, I don't, I don't think a writer is making statements. I'm, I'm not trying to make a statement about the climate crisis in this novel. What I'm trying to offer a reader is an experience of complexity and multiple points of points of view. I mean, again, you know, there's climate change deniers in this in this novel. And I don't, I want them also to have some complexity. Their, you know, their cynicism, their real politique. Um, I want them to be humorous too. Um, there needs to be some humor in a climate change novel, I would argue. Um, but it's always, it's it's gotta be, um, yeah, it's gotta be experiential. And, and, and I do feel that that's something that fiction does is offer us multiple truths, multiple truths colliding um, in a dramatic space. Um, and that's, you know, that's what I, that's what I would hope to do. And, you know, when in the early days that I was working on this novel and encountered someone who said, you know, who was an environmentalist who said, don't write about climate engineering. And I, said, well, you know, why ever not? And I'm not an advocate for something here. I'm trying to dramatize um, the, eth you know, the ethical um, debates around something like this and, and, and lived experience of, of, of desire. Why would someone desire um, something like this? And, and why else would, would someone else not desire it? All right, a question that's a little different. Um from Wendy, can you tell us how you made the choice of a male father scientist instead of a woman scientist? I guess, you know, I was using the template of, um, of the Tempest and I could, as in there's a, there's a Julie Tamer movie version in which Prospero becomes Prospera or Martha Henry at Stratford played um, a female uh, Prospero. I don't know if she called herself Prospera. So I could have, change the um the sex of the climate scientist um but i guess i've i mean in a sense my first novel minus time is very much about a mother daughter relationship and and i was very interested in a father daughter relationship here that was what i wanted to animate and animate care and protectiveness um from from a father, I think, you know, we tend to associate those emotions as being maternal ones. Um, and so to, to generate that kind of care from that intense protectiveness um, from a father was really interesting to me. Uh, okay, this one, I actually really wanna know the answer to this one myself. <laughs> what other stories have influenced your writing about climate change in this book? Um, well, I certainly, I certainly read, um, Barbara Kingsolver's flight behavior and that was, 
um, you know, sort of a fascinating um, study in, in how you can, um, you know, create a specific situation, these monarch butterflies who end up in this, um, in this valley in the United States um, by chance and the, the collision of the lives of various characters and their um, very different walks of life um, who come together or whose lives are changed by these butterflies. And, you know, the way that politics and the, and the everyday is seen through that novel is, is very powerful. Um, I've mentioned Lydia Millet before and, and one of her earlier novels, um, uh, How the Dead Dream, which is kind of a metaphoric story about a capitalist who ends up at the end of this novel basically embracing, you know, he's sort of thrown away everything and ends up embracing this badger-like, you know, mother animal by a riverside, again, was just, you know, quite extraordinary. And um, I'm trying to think what else, you know, in a very different way, Barbara Gowdy's elephant novel, The White Bone, just is an act of extraordinary, extraordinary empathy. Um, the work of Catherine Davis, the um, American writer, um, her novel, A Thin Place, in which there's just this porous consciousness that moves into lichen and a beaver and a dog and from human to human um, was again, really interesting to me. So again, you know, these examples are not, you know, necessarily cli-fi. And, and for me, that's what's interesting about them is that they're, they're, they're but what they're all interested in is in, in expanding our um, our empathetic zone and um, and where consciousness lies in a novel and so all were were fascinating to me for that reason. I think we need a list. Um, that sounds amazing. All of those. Um, uh, this question, Catherine, do you have a hope for the potential impact of your novel on a reader? What might it do in the world? Well, I, you know, I hope the novel is is read, and I and I hope that it does. Um, I hope that it does invite people to think about the the climate crisis in a way that perhaps they haven't um, through the ethical debates in the in the novel between um, Mill and Wells and and his three you know young scientist assistants. Um, it's not one Ariel in this novel. There's there's three younger scientists. Um, just to you know think about things. Or Mahak was saying that she hadn't really thought about climate engineering before. And again, you know, we don't have to become advocates for it or 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 um, you know activists against it. But just to to consider um, it as as something that is being you know ethically ethically discussed by scientists that we should be thinking about. And and I. So I, you know, I want people to think about um, their relationship to climate and weather more, um, and and just to notice the world a little differently. Notice the wind. If someone goes out and is aware of the way the the wind direction shifts um, in a way that they never had before, I mean that too would be wondrous to me. Because that yeah. is, I think, as necessary as anything else in terms of what's going to going to help us survive. And I didn't say this before, but there were other things too. I mean, for me, reading it in terms of my impact. Um, uh, so the idea of traveling by plane and how we should avoid it. I've always understood that idea intellectually, but in the novel, it really, you know, we're talking about characterizing climate change. It became emotional. It, it has always felt like this yes or no decision and not this very deeply felt decision that I've been able to consider before but um there's you know the, the novel does compel us to sort of stay in that place in our hearts not just in our minds um and the same with the language like the environment just coming alive around you and really appreciating it through that language um thank you I hope I think we have time for I'm not being loaded off yet so I think we still have time for questions because there's more here um the New Yorker has described this as an era of science suspicion. How do we combat this in fiction? Um, well, we can put scientists in in our novels, um, which is you know one of the things that that I've that I've done, you know, and 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 I think you know making 
making scientists human and making bringing science to to life um, so that it's dynamic and lived and and not just a realm of of data that lives over there. Um, I mean, I'm very I, again, I'm not a scientist, but I'm very interested in um, and an experiential relationship to, to science and um, and the way that you know the expansive way that science invites us to see to see the world and you know I mean there it can it can lead us into certain kinds of objectification but in the best way it can also lead us towards wonder and mystery you know to contemplate deep spans of time the way geologists do or you know the universe the way astronomers do. Um, all, all these possible ways that just ex expand our sense of, of, of where we, where we are and, um, you know, in this, in a, in a cosmos basically, and, and bring us back to, to wonder, I think, which um, to my mind is where, you know, where science begins and where, you know, and where literature, art, storytelling, you know, the act, the desire to make meaning um, beginning in, in, in a kind of wonder, I think. Yeah, and this this may dovetail really well with this next question. What type of narrative would engage a large part of the country on climate change? You mentioned you were thinking about this. So many climate communicators are trying to reach people, different philosophies on what narratives resonate with people and actually stick with people. Yeah, I mean, that is, that is you know, it's such a fundamental question and I guess, you know, one of the things, and, and this is something that my, my sister and I did an event together, my sister Elizabeth, the climate science and advisor and I did an event together last week and we were discussing this. And, you know, I mean, it's very important not to, in terms of cultural narratives, not to make people feel judged by their behavior, you know, by flying in planes or, you know, driving cars or whatever. Um, but again, um, I think, you know, expanding our, our our sense of, of care and kinship. And, um, and I think it's really as, and, and essential to do that by moving out beyond the human, as, as I've said. So how, how do we create stories that, that do that? But starting in, starting in care, it seems to me, and, and you know, moving away from the story of the individual um, to, again, a, a story that centers community um, feels very important. Uh, okay, this question. I'm just wondering if uh, agents, editors were excited about your topic or if it was tougher than you had anticipated. Can you share a little bit about that process? I think it's a question about just publishing a story about this topic. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, since I began writing it, and there, there's quite a lot of, of eco fiction or climate fiction being written these days. And it's, you know, when I started this novel, there really wasn't so much. I mean, I was writing into more of a, of a, of a, a sense of, of a need for this kind of work. Um, and so, you know, I think it, it, it goes up and down, you know, in terms of publishing there's, but I think as with any subject, it's all how you do it, you know, that particular, slant or extraordinariness that you can that you can bring that can knock the tops of people's heads off or you know shift the shift the way they see the world um and you know that's that's what that's what good writing does and and that's what you know the best you know climate change novels have have got to do too not just tell us what we already know but um, but tell us what we what we don't yet know and write into uncertainty and complexity, but also be able to bring us back to, you know, to to joy and and love and um, and the keenest possible noticings of the world. Thank you so much, Catherine. I'm receiving a message that we should wrap up now. Um, this has been such a great conversation. And the only last thing I want to say for our audience, as I mentioned, you know, Catherine and I have already talked about her novel. And um, there's just so much richness in this book that we can keep continuing this conversation. So please don't go out, check out Blaze Island, read it, experience that biosphere for yourself. Um, and I'll hand things off now to Susan from Wild Writers. Oh, thank you, Catherine and Mahak. Um, you've given us lots to think about in terms of the, I think the complexity and significance of using fiction 
and storytelling to deal with issues like climate change. I want to remind everyone of uh, the fact that they can get Catherine's uh, book, Blaze Island, and her other books, and the Hacks books, um, online from Wordsworth Books in Waterloo, Ontario. The link for ordering is in the Q&A window of your screen, or it can be found at our website, wildwriters.ca. I also uh, want to remind you that this session, like most of the festival events, is free of charge. So if you feel moved to donate as a supporter of this festival, you'll find a link on our website to do that. Finally, the session has been recorded and will be available uh, throughout the festival, that is till the end of November, if you want to see it again or have, you know, tell one of your friends about it. I hope you've enjoyed the conversation as much as I did. Thank you so much. The next Wild Writers Literary Festival event is a meditation tomorrow morning at nine o'clock with Dale Richardson. And on Saturday, November 14th at one o'clock in the afternoon, you can attend a group discussion on how to create a successful writing group. Everyone is welcome to join in. Thank you all for joining us tonight. Good night.